Hi, and uh, welcome to our series about um, catechesis and evangelization in these current times. I'm Kathy McNicholas. I'm the pastoral associate and director of faith formation at Incarnation Parish, and I have been in that role for 18 years. And over the course of that time, I have come to experience, as many of you who are also in the catechetical field or work with handing on the Catholic faith, especially to children, but also to adults, have noticed a change in what God is calling us to in this new reality. And part of the reason for that change, I think, is that the world that we are in is a very different world than it was in the past, but also I think the individuals, the souls that we are accompanying on this journey of growing in a relationship with God and growing in an understanding of what it means to be Catholic and growing in an understanding of who we are in this world, the people who are walking the journey with us are also very different. And I, for some of you out there, I don't know how long you've been in the world of catechesis or maybe you're brand new to this understanding, but something just brought you to this video, that brought you to this moment, something that you were searching for, or looking for, the Lord brought you to this. We are going to spend the next six weeks talking about what is the reality of being someone who is called to share their faith, their relationship with God, their Catholic faith with another person at this particular time in history. So. Tonight's focus is going to be primarily on what, what am I talking about? What exactly are we talking about here? And how do I come to have this understanding of what this new reality is looking like or feeling like or what the Holy Spirit is calling us to? So we're going to begin with a prayer. And it's always a good place to start is with a prayer and to ask for the Holy Spirit's continued guidance and accompaniment. The Holy Spirit is a great gift to us in the world. So we will start with a prayer. And so I'm just going to ask you to take a breath and draw in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Breathe in the love of God and the commitment that we have as members of his body to be united in love and in faith and to be committed to and pushed by the Spirit out to the world to share the great message of Jesus Christ with others. And so if you want to either join in with the prayer or I can read the prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. All right, so as we get started on this journey, what are we talking about? Well, let's start with a question. And this is a question, it's not a rhetorical question, it's an actual question that I want you to consider, and that question is, what is going wrong in our world today? What keeps you up at night? What what angst or challenges do you see facing our world today? And so if you, you have a thought at home, you know, just write it on a piece of paper or think about that. What does God place on your heart as being some of the things that we're dealing with in the world? And I'm going to ask the people here present to just shout out for me. What are some of the things that we are dealing with in the world today? Violence, okay, yep, violence in, in many forms. So um, at this point in history, I don't know where we're at, if you're watching this video, we have just recently had both a shooting, a school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, where 21 people, 19 children were murdered. And then also a very, very recent 4th of July shooting at the Highland Park Parade, which is fairly close to where we are. Um, so there's physical violence, but there's also violence in the way we treat each other, the way we talk to each other, the way we judge others as other and ostracize them or protest against them. And so there's a lot of violence in a variety. There's violence in our homes. There's violence in the workplace. There's a lot of violence we're dealing with. So for sure, violence is a, is a major challenge for us. And it, Family breakdown. 
Okay, family breakdown. So can you give me a little bit more of what that means for you? Right, I mean, uh, you know, divorces, alienation, <clears throat> okay. blended families, um, especially when it comes to, you know, faith practices, all that. Okay. Kind of a quagmire. Okay, so uh, divorce, the breakdown of the family. Some families don't even, they don't get married at all. They just, I met a couple once and they said, you know, we're not going to get married because we don't want to end up in divorce. So we're just not going to get married. So that's their solution to fear of divorce, fear of a destruction of a marriage and what that might cause. Rather than getting married and try to build on that, then the answer would be, well, then let's just not get married. We'll just live together, which as we know statistically and from uh, people that you probably know in your life, that does not create a bond of security or safety that actually puts you closer to the brink of separation. So divorces, you also have one partner may have faith and the other one does not. You have issues around um, morality that tear families apart. You have blended families. You have, there are lots of things that have happened in homes that have changed. So I'm I'm, I just turned 63 years old, so I'm, I can remember back like in the 1960s where it um, was the golden age, the suburban world where, you know, the mom and the dad and the picket fence and the dog and the 2.5 children, uh, which, if I'm being honest with you, was um, a little bit fake. That wasn't always so rosy in those situations either, but at least we projected an image of rosiness and happiness and everything went well. And now fast forward to this, this particular time and it's a very different reality. And if you work in catechesis, you already know this. This is not a surprise to you because we're now dealing with many, many different situations. We just had a little girl the other day, the family brought her in to be baptized, eight years old. And in the course of preparing her for baptism and meeting with her and walking with the family, found out that there's an older brother who's 15, who's also not baptized, but through the experience is now wanting to come into the church. He himself is wanting to come in too. So, um, so yeah, so there's, a, there's that to deal with. That we don't have the family structure that we had in the past. Anything else that's coming to mind? Divisiveness. Divisiveness, yeah. And that's one that, that actually hits me hard on a regular basis. So uh, again, historically what's happening right now in the United States, if you're watching this, is we recently had, uh, actually it was on my birthday, June 24th, not to promote my birthday, but the decision um, by the Supreme Court overturning a constitutional, federal constitutional right to abortion, overturning the Roe versus Wade decision, and what that did in families. I, I have family members that are now not speaking to each other. I have a, a sister-in-law who's not talking to her daughter. It somewhat splits along generational lines, but the divisiveness that breaks down relationship and the sense of unity based on issues or ideas or concepts instead of being something that we talk to each other about now becomes violent and there is there is the destruction of relationship over that. So, again, uh, another another really difficult, challenging um, part of the world that we live in right now. So, so yeah, and we could go on. I we could we could spend probably two hours uh, that we don't have talking about what are the challenges that we face as society and. And if I said to you, I'm not going to switch to the next slide yet, but if I said to you, so what do we do? I mean, as people of faith, people of hope, we're called to respond to that. What is the answer? How do, and, I, you know, I, if you're out there going, I know, I know, I know the answer for those kids. Like I was in school, like, ah, call on me, call on me. To know the answer for, for people of faith, the best way to meet those challenges is Jesus. What the world needs now, what the world always has needed, what the world has needed since Adam and Eve first introduced sin into the world. The first, our, our mother and father, the original human beings through free will brought sin into the world. The answer to what we need is Jesus. The answer is always Jesus. And for us as Christians, our heart and our being goes to the Lord as being the one who brings reconciliation to divisiveness, who brings peace to violence, who speaks of the love and the compassion and the empathy and the unity that we have. 
So if Jesus is the answer, and we know that to be true, that Jesus is the answer, then why are we losing ground? And what do I mean by that losing ground? What I mean by losing ground is less and less people in the United States, and I think this is statistically true in many places in, in the Western world, in Europe, and are, are reporting themselves to be either non-believers, don't believe in God at all, don't, or certainly non-religious, walking away from institutions of faith walking away from a, an awareness of the value there might be in having a relationship with Jesus, in being the body of Christ in the world, of making a difference through the graces of Jesus Christ. And the statistics are bad, let's be honest, this, and they're getting worse. The statistics are getting worse. So um, there's a, the latest Pew, if you want to look for research on Religion in America, Pew, P-E-W, research is the, is the front runner in doing, and they've been doing research for years, and they have a lot of statistics, it's depressing, about the number of people who identify themselves as Christian or who identify themselves as Catholic or who identify themselves as having any faith whatsoever. For a long time there, and it's the, it's, I haven't checked recently, the number one identified religious group in the United States was as as a unity was catholic if you separate the different christian denominations the number two identified religious group in the united states was i used to be catholics they were the second largest group of people so if that says anything about the statistics about the number of people that have walked away from the church and if you want an even more sobering piece of information if you need it and you might know this from your own lived experience either in your family or in whatever catechetical program that you work with the average age now that young people report to disaffiliate from the Catholic Church, meaning this is the age at which young people say, that's when I was out the door, didn't come back again. Think about it for a minute, what you might guess that age might be. And if you guessed 13, 14, you're right. About the age of 13 or 14, and if you think about that from the perspective of the Catholic, current Catholic trajectory of the way that we accompany people on their journey in the church, that is right after confirmation. So you have a bunch of kids, teens, that you have worked with very intensely sometimes for two years to prepare themselves to receive the sacrament of the Holy Spirit and God's graces to become apostles for Christ on mission in the world and their reaction to that within a matter of months is see ya out the door and maybe never to return maybe someday to return unknown so what is happening here and I'll tell you again I've been doing I've been in my role more or less with this title for 18 years but when I started the job that I did was very different than the job that I do now and I attest that to the power of the Holy Spirit speaking to me, speaking through me, the Lord calling me. In the beginning, it had a lot to do with um, taking attendance for kids coming to class and making sure that they had their sacrament. So like that was the question. If a family came to meet me and they were new to the program, the first thing I would say to them is, have you made your sacraments? And if they were on track, if they were on the right Catholic track, they would say, oh, yes, we're baptized. We made our first communion. We just need confirmation, whatever it is, depending on the age of the child. Baptized as an infant, made their first communion about second grade, confirmed around seventh and eighth grade, sometimes high school. That was the question that I would ask. And, and that's how I would determine how to meet their needs to accompany them on the journey was, okay, what sacraments do you need? That's what I would ask. And if they needed a, a particular sacrament, that's where I would plug them into the system. Okay, we have you know, door number one, door number two, door number three. Or if you're not in a sacramental year, then we get you into like a regular general catechesis. Maybe we'll get you a Bible. That's how we'll do it. And I don't mean to be glib about it, but it, it was a fairly simplistic and straightforward process. And I kind of knew how to do that. And then over time, I would start to meet families and they didn't fit the mold very well. And here's what I mean by that. There would be families that would come in and they didn't have their sacraments, but 
they had a strong faith that maybe they did service or they prayed at home. They had a relationship with Jesus. And I'm like, hmm, I, I don't know exactly where to fit those people. Like they're supposed to have, uh, um, they're supposed to fit into door number one, door number two, or door number three. They don't really fit. Or conversely, and maybe more frequently, I would meet families that had brought their kids in to get their sacraments right on cue as was needed. But they never went to Mass. They never prayed. They never really had any kind of a, a context for a relationship with the Lord outside of the sense of I brought them, they made their sacraments, and now we jumped out again. Kind of like double, I jumped in, we did a sacrament, we jumped out again, and then in eighth grade we jumped back in, got another sacrament, and jumped. It, it, it was this odd awareness of what it meant to be Catholic, and we're going to explore that a little bit more. What God is calling us to be in this new reality is to have a deeper, more fulfilled understanding of what it means to be someone who's Catholic. The old models that we used are not fitting anymore with the new reality of the families that we encounter and the families that we seek to accompany along the way. So hold on, because it's not the message of Jesus Christ that needs to change. Jesus is our savior. Jesus is the answer to how to build the kingdom of God in this earthly world. But the method that we have been using to share that message with young people, with children, with families, with adults, with the world is, needs to change. And that's what these six weeks are going to be about. What exactly does that mean? What is the new image for what it means to be a Catholic and how do we start making changes in the ways that we who are called to hand on the faith, hand on the faith? And you're going to hear me use the word frequently, accompaniment. Accompaniment. And accompaniment, accompaniment means to walk with someone. And we're going to talk about what is this enhanced understanding of what it means to be Catholic, how does the role of the catechist different? The person who's handing on the faith, how do we need to look at ourselves differently in order to look at the task that's being placed before us by the Lord differently? And then we turn to the model of Jesus. What did Jesus specifically teach us in scripture, in the gospels, about how to walk with someone, how to accompany someone? I don't think he generally pulled out a catechism book or set them down, or gave them a homework assignment, or had them do exercises in a workbook. And that includes even with children. You know, sometimes we say, well, with adults we would do it different, but this is what children need to learn. No, it's, it's more than that. And um, before you think that I'm, what I'm saying is get rid of your workbooks, because we're not going to do catechesis, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is kind of like when people ask Jesus about the law, the Ten Commandments. And he said, every bit of that is good and necessary. I'm not changing it at all. But there's more. I come to fulfill that. And so handing on the faith, it, the catechetical component, the, the teachings of the church are so important for kids to know information. So if you're a information kind of a person and you're freaking out going, ah, she's going to say, you know, we're just going to go back to the days of Kumbaya, which I grew up in those days, the post-Vatican II days, where we watched film strips and we released balloons. Um, I'm not talking about that. I am not. There is, a, there is a, a relationship that takes place between evangelization and catechesis, and they partner together. But if we just focus on the catechesis, which has been the experience of what I've been taught and trained to do as a catechetical leader, if we just stay focused on the catechesis, we're going to continue to have people who are intellectually Catholic, and maybe have experienced the sacraments, but their hearts are not open to the Lord. They may not even know the Lord at all. They may have never, you could actually get through eight years of religious ed and receive all the sacraments and never know or recognize or open your interior heart to an actual relationship with Jesus. And without that relationship with Jesus, all the information, all the catechetical information in the world 
is not going to hold you to this faith. Because people are not Christians because of our dogma or doctrine. In my experience, in my own personal life and in talking with others, people are Christians because they have an actual lived relationship with Jesus Christ. Because somehow the Lord has reached into their heart and made himself known to them in a very real living encounter way. And as a result of that, now they are opened. Their heart is opened and what comes at them feeds that relationship. It's kind of like falling in love with somebody. You know, do you fall in love with somebody because you read their bio online? Ooh, I read this guy's bio and he's, you know, X, Y, and Z. And those are great things. I love him. I mean, I suppose it's possible for some people if they have a certain understanding of what love is. But in real love takes place with an encounter. It's a relationship. It's two people who come to know each other. And then once I know you and I, I, I love you and my heart is open to you, I want to know everything there is to know about you. And that's catechesis. But the love, the encounter, the, the open-heartedness to Jesus is necessary first in order for the catechesis to be something that you welcome into you and you integrate into you and it becomes a part of you. And then that is transformational and life-changing. And that is what turns your life around and is that relationship with Jesus. And so is it even possible in a catechetical program? Is it possible to have kids come in and somehow not just address the mind or even primarily address the mind, the information, the catechism, the doctrine, the dogma, the teachings of the church, but to actually invite them into an encounter with the Lord? Are there ways that we can actually walk with people that bring them into a lived encounter with Jesus Christ, an actual experience of the love of God? And I believe the answer is yes. And I believe that the way it happens is through the dynamic of the Holy Spirit and the graces of Christ within us that then go out. And if someone is made aware that that is the process that's happening and they open their heart, then that it, it takes place. Somehow the Lord lets us participate in the spirituality of shared union in Christ. So so where do we start? Okay, so let's start with a really, really, to me, very good example of what I'm talking about that comes actually from the secular world, from the business world. So Simon Simonek is a uh, well, pretty well-known speaker on leadership, on business, on corporations, on how to call up leadership, on how to be a company that's successful in the modern world. And if you've never seen any of his videos, he's really entertaining, so fun to listen to. So I urge you to go onto YouTube or, or a TED Talk and, and Google him. But I heard him speaking one day, and he was talking about the business world. But of course, to me, it immediately translated to what we do in ministry. And what he talked about is something that's called the golden circle. And he said, and if you think about this, this is, this is true, that most companies, when they do their advertising, their marketing, when they project who they are to the world, they focus on what they do or what their product is and a little bit maybe on how they do it. So, so he talks about companies that will say, you know, what we do, we make computers and um, we you know, where they're made in America and um, our focus is on our customers. And he says the companies that are successful, though, they do it in reverse order. They start with what's at the center of the circle, which is why should you buy our computer? They create the sense of who, you, who we are. So for instance, he talks about Apple and says, what does it mean for somebody who wants to run out right away and get all the new Apple products? I want to be cutting edge. I want to be new technology. I want to be a person of the future. Why you should buy Apple and that's very different than saying Apple makes computers or Apple makes watches or Apple makes the iPhone. They don't start with the product or with how they make it. They start with why you should be part of their world. 
And when I, when I heard him say that, it was like a light bulb went off in my head. I'm like, that's part of what we need to shift. Because what do we spend the bulk of our time talking about in catechesis? It's what it means to be a Catholic and how you do that. It's, it's, it's doctrine and dogma and a little bit of sacramentology. Here's how you're going to become a Catholic. You're going to learn these things and study these things, and you're going to make these sacraments. Boom, you're going to be a Catholic. But we don't talk about why. Why would you want to be somebody who's learning the catechism and somebody who's receiving the sacraments? So I, just, I invite you to just stop and think for a minute. If somebody asked you, why are you a Catholic? How would you answer that question? Why am I Catholic? You know, St. Paul says we should always be ready with an answer to the question of where is your hope from? Why are you who you are? And I, I work with adults in an adult confirmation class. Most of them are between the ages of maybe 25 and 40, the vast majority of them. So what I would consider as a 63-year-old young adults, I don't think they would consider themselves young adults. They're full adults. But I ask them that question because they, they're baptized, they've received their Holy Communion usually as a child, and now they've reached a point in their life where what they want to do is make a commitment to being Catholic. And some of them will say, well, you know, the reason I want to be confirmed and become a Catholic, fully Catholic is because I want to get married in the church or because I want to be a godparent. And those are all very, very um, good surface reasons. But I always turn that around to them and say, well, but there's a lot of people who get married and they're not getting married in church. They're getting married in Vegas or they're not getting married at all. They're at a destination wedding or they just aren't even getting married. Or if someone asks them to be a godparent, they say no, because I'm not Catholic and I'm not into that. So that can't be the only reason why you're here. And so what I say to them is, I believe, we believe the reason that you're here is that the Lord is calling you. Just like the Lord has called every soul that the Lord has called from the time that he was here. The, the, starting with the call of the disciples and continues to call. So the Lord is calling you to a deeper relationship with him. The Lord is calling you to a different way of being, a, a different way of life, and you have answered that call. You have, you have answered his, and that's why you're here. So let's talk about this journey in a very different kind of way. It's not just about the information that's coming to you. It's about this relationship that you are being invited to participate with. So the why we are Catholic. I mean, if somebody said to me, if I met someone on the street and they asked me, why are you Catholic? I would say, because the Lord spoke to me. I mean, I was raised in a Catholic, I'm a cradle Catholic, I was raised in a Catholic context, but I really wasn't, I wasn't really firmly in the Catholic camp, let's just put it that way. For most of my high school days, college days, even when I was married, I got married in the church, but I didn't really, I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. I didn't even know you could have a relationship with Jesus until I was in my 40s. And then I had an experience, actually, a, a, I was... In Arizona, I was sitting by myself on the side of a creek, and I was praying, and I had been praying that the Lord, I was going through a pretty rough time in my life, and I was praying, asking the Lord to, if he was, if he was real, which is always an interesting question, Lord, if you're really there, show yourself to me, which isn't that the cry of each human heart, but, and he did, and he showed himself to me, and my reaction to it actually was, wait, you are real? Like, I, I honestly thought I was having some type of a, of a breakdown. I, I, even though I was Catholic my whole life, no one had prepared me for the fact that I not only could have an actual lived relationship with Jesus, but Jesus was pursuing me to have this relationship with him. No one had ever said that to me. So I just thought of it as, you know, like there were saints that would have this relationship with Jesus, but not the average person. So when it happened to me, I was totally unprepared for it. And it changed my life. And I really had to grow into what it meant to be somebody who was living in a relationship with Jesus. And my life is completely different than it was before that event happened. So why am I a Catholic? 
it's kind of like when they asked Carl Jung once, the great psychologist, why, if he believed in God, and he paused and he said, I don't know how to answer that question because it's not a belief. It's a fact for me. I know God. So I don't have to make a leap of faith. I, I'm in a relationship with God. And it's kind of like that for me. It's not, it's, not any, it's not any more an act of faith to think, is there a God? God and I talk every single day. Multiple times during the day, if I'm having a bad day, it's a constant, oh, Lord, help me. Oh, Lord, having a rough time. And he's always, it's okay, it's okay. We were just doing a Bible study this morning on Martha and Mary. And, um, and they were like, wow, Jesus was kind of harsh to Martha. When, if you know the story, you know, Mar Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, their sisters. And Martha is like, okay, she's working hard in the kitchen. And she comes out and says, hey, Lord, I'm overwhelmed by what's happening. Tell Mary to get up and come and help me. And, G and Jesus says to uh, Martha, hey, Martha, Martha, leave her alone. She's doing the right thing. And they're like, wow, that was kind of mean. Jesus sounded mean to Jesus. I said, you know what? I don't imagine it that way. I don't imagine that's his tone of voice. To me, he's saying, Martha, Martha, it's okay. It's okay. You know what? You're busy and anxious about a lot of things. The important thing, keep your eyes focused on me. I'm walking here with you all the time. It's all going to be okay. Almost like he did with the apostles in the storm in the boat where he says to them, do you not get it? If I'm with you, nothing bad can happen to you. Things can happen to your physical body, but our physical bodies are temporary anyway. I'm with you. And if I'm with you, everything is always going to be okay. You don't have to be worried or anxious about anything. So I think when he, when he reached out to Martha, it wasn't scolding. It was comforting. You know, I like to imagine that right after that, he said, you know what, leave this stuff in the kitchen. It'll be fine. Come and have a seat right here with me. Let me give you a hug. Are you okay? That's why I'm Catholic. Because the Lord is that for me every day of my life. And I don't know how to live a human life without that. So that message, does that message carry through to the people that we accompany? To the children? to the adults, to the families that are so in desperate need of that message. They are anxious. They are burdened. They are struggling. And what does the Lord say? Hey, it's okay. I'm with you. You're not in this alone. That's the why message. And the why message in whichever way you have experienced it with the Lord and however you articulate that is at the heart of what makes a catechist in today's world. How we get there, we're going we're gonna to figure it out. But where we're going is to a, a point at which when someone comes to you and their life is, they're like Martha running out of, ah, help me, somebody help me. Our response to that is, listen to the Lord. Come to know the Lord. Because in my life, when that happens, the Lord is there for me and he wants to be there for you. So let's figure out how to open your heart to hear the Lord speak. Because from that place, you can handle whatever is going to come your way. That's why we do what we do. And that's the message that needs to come first. Not what we do as Catholics, although that's important, and we're going to talk about that, the inner relationship. There are moments in that deepening relationship that a, a soul is having with Jesus where you need to bring in more information. Like those stories I just shared. If, if I didn't know gospel stories about Martha and Mary or the storm at sea or Peter walking on the water, I couldn't help bridge for that other soul how to connect to Jesus through the scripture stories. The scripture stories are one of the ways that we build that connection for someone else to have that lived experience, that lived encounter with Jesus is through stories that translate into my life and I can translate into someone else's life. So the what is essential, but it only makes sense if they understand why. And the why is to live in a loving, real relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the why. All right. So we talked about this. 
Why are you Catholic? If you have never thought about it before, if that question threw you when I said, think about it for a minute. If somebody asked you, why are you Catholic? And you, you have never thought about that, that is a wonderful personal reflection for you to be doing throughout this journey of watching these videos. Pull out a notebook and, and start to write and let it, let it roll and roll around within you each week as you're listening to the different, um, you know, the enhancements of what we're talking about, what it means to be Catholic. Let that grow within you. Let that cycle within you and develop that into a sense of what is your story? Because we're going to talk eventually about your story is the greatest tool that you have to introduce someone else to a relationship with Jesus. Your own personal story, the story that Jesus is living within your life is the greatest resource that you have. So become familiar with that. Come to know your own story. And it's, it can take time. I will tell you from that thing that happened with me when I was in my early 40s, it probably took me, and I'm just not a lot, it's not, it probably took me eight years, 10 years to tell anybody about what happened. I told nobody, because I'm like, okay, people are gonna be like, really, wow, she's out there. If I did, it, it made me very, very uncomfortable to talk about it, and even now, it, when I share it, I only share it in certain contexts when the Holy Spirit prompts me to say something about it. And most of the time, that, I don't lead with that. I do not lead with that story. It comes after I know people a little bit better. So, so the fact that I'm, use, I'm using it here is the Holy Spirit clearly wants me to, sh ha to share that, what happened in my story. The same will be true for you as well. You need to be, become more aware of your own story to be able to articulate your story and then to learn to listen for when to share it and when not. Okay, so just in case you're also not like, okay, that's it, click, I'm changing channels because this woman is coming up with some stuff and I don't know where she's getting it from. Here's where it's coming from. I, I, this is not, I'm not just like, although I was born on the, I don't know if you figured that out from the Roe versus Wade commentary that I was born on June 24th, which is the feast of the birthday of John the Baptist. So I, I know that there's a connection there and I am a little bit like locusts and wild honey. I can get a little bit on the fringe. So if you're thinking, okay, this woman is fringe and I don't know, should I better call my priest and say, can I, should I really be watching this? I, let me tell you, I'm right in line with what the entire church is saying right now. So, so let's talk about some of these other resources, references, if you want to look and read a little bit more about this. And I hope you do. I hope you're intrigued by this. I hope the Holy Spirit is like pulling you into this in a really powerful way. But so in the Archdiocese of Chicago, which is, which is where I minister, you'll see this on the end. We're going through a process called Renew My Church. And we're coming out of some very, what has been a, a, a long process of structuring of, of parishes and combining parishes and looking at staff and that kind of thing. But now we're in the building the new reality stage. That's what they call it, is building the new reality. And, and there are some components of building the new reality. And you'll see the one that I highlighted right here. If, I don't know if you can read it. Zoom in close. Readiness-based faith formation. Hmm. Readiness-based faith formation. What does that mean? It's, it's exactly what we're talking about. It's, it's not an academic or, or an, um, an educational process of being Catholic, of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's a journey of faith in which we move closer to the Lord. He reveals more to us. We desire a deeper relationship. And when that happens, we come for a sacrament that fills us with more graces, that deepens that relationship, that brings us to a deeper commitment. It's not, this happens at this age. This happens at, I'll tell you something, when I was, when I was even what made sense to me was driver's licenses. How is it that the, the government has decided that every young person, by virtue of turning 16, is eligible to drive? Because I knew some 18-year-olds that should never be behind the wheel. And I knew some 13-year-olds who could probably handle that responsibility. How do you pick a random number and say, at this particular age, you are able to drive a car? Faith, even more confusing to me. Because there were saints that were 13 years old. We just celebrated the feast day of St. Maria Goretti. There are, there are saints that are young uh, Mary, the mother of God, was probably 14, 15 years old when the angel Gabriel came to her. And there are saints that are in their 70s and 80s. So, 
so how we came to understand that the moments of grace that the sacraments that Christ has given us are connected to a biological age or an academic process it makes no more sense to me than everybody at 16 should get a driver's license, which, by the way, we were not allowed to get driver's licenses at 16 in my house. You couldn't get a driver's license until you had a job and could pay for insurance. Because my dad was like, you know what, you don't get the right without the responsibility. And while I hated it at the time, I get his thought processes. It's kind of like that now, readiness-based faith formation. The sacraments are not something that you earn by showing up to class and memorizing information. That is a false understanding of what a sacrament really is about. The sacraments are gifts of God's grace that are in relationship with the way that we have are growing and transforming our internal spiritual life to be more in connection with God. They're not magic. They're not. I had somebody email me once, a young man, and he, long before I had started at the parish that I was at, he had been in the religious ed program there and he was confirmed when he was in eighth grade. And now he was older, and in his own words, I am an avowed atheist and I want any record of me ever having been confirmed or baptized to be stricken from all of the records there at the parish. I don't want any, I don't want any reference anymore to me as associated with your, with your parish. And wow, did I have to take that to prayer. Because I could hear the truth of his anguish, but I also felt like this was a moment of, of where he needed accompaniment. So after a while, after praying about it a lot, I did, I did respond. And I said, first of all, let me tell you that I'm really sorry that you were confirmed against your will. Because we wouldn't do that, and that's true. You can ask people in my parish. There have been every year in the last five to seven years there has been at least one young person who said they're not ready and I will I will go to the mat with the parents and say this kid is not ready and because I work with older high schoolers and adults I always say to them it's they're not abandoned we will continue to walk with them and we do there are people I'm walking with even now who are in high school that just weren't ready and we're waiting for the moment when they feel ready so I said if you if that if you it was you and I was here we wouldn't have confirmed you. But having said that, in the same way that what negates a birth certificate is a death certificate, I can't negate your baptismal certificate or your confirmation certificate because those are facts. They happened. They are historical things that took place. But I will tell you, they're not magic spells. And so if you truly don't believe in God, which I take you at your word, I'm not arguing with you, then think of it as if you're given a gift and you threw it in the closet and you never opened it. It's not going to do anything to you. It's not going to, you know, it's, it's something that we cooperate with in the journey of life. It's not a magic spell. And so he actually emailed me back and said, thank you for taking the time. And I think what I was really upset about is that my parents were forcing me to do something. They wouldn't listen to me. So it ended up being, you know, by God's grace, it ended up being, I think, a good conversation for both of us. But readiness-based faith formation says that you don't look at the externals of the age or the academics of a child to determine their spiritual readiness to receive Jesus in a deeper way and the graces of a sacrament. What we're going to look at, and if you're going, okay, well then what do I use? There are things we can look at, and we're going to talk about that. So keep coming back and watch, because this is we're going to we're going to walk through this process slowly, because it's it's pretty different for a lot of people's understanding. But I also believe that somewhere in your heart of hearts, you know that this is true. It's resonating with you that this is true. So so that's in the Archdiocese of Chicago. Um, also, the Pope has come out with in his latest thing to say that a cat, to be a catechist is a vocation in life, meaning it's a calling by Christ to encounter people in this way using the story of your life, as which is what I just said. What's the best resource you're going to have? The story of your own life. A catechist echoes their own relationship with God to the person that they are walking with. So is, if you are a catechist and you say, you know what, I feel called to this, this is a vocation, then the Holy Spirit is going to help move you in this direction. 
On the end, that's the new directory for catechesis. That's from the United States Council of Catholic Bishops. And so a lot of the content that I'm using comes from the new directory on, on, on catechesis, which is very evangelization focused, meaning it's not just the information, it's the encounter with Christ. Evangelization means sharing with somebody the good news of Jesus. And you can do it through scripture stories, but the most powerful way to do it is to share the good news of who Jesus is in your life. That is evangelization. So if that seems like a big scary word and you're like, ooh, evangelization, that's not. Well, let's be honest, catechesis is a big scary word too. To be a catechist, that's a lot to wrap your head around. And here's another one, kerygma, which you're going to hear as well. A kerygma is just, in simple terms, a kerygma is the primary proclamation of who Jesus Christ is to someone who does not know who Jesus is. And so if you are telling somebody who Jesus is, like my sharing that story with me, that Jesus came and saved my life and now lives with me and, and, and is with me and helps me to live, that is a charismatic story. That is introducing somebody else to a proclamation of who Jesus is and how he lives and is present in my life and saves me. And it involves catechesis eventually telling stories about who Jesus is from scripture. But the kerygma, when you meet another soul that does not know Jesus, your first encounter with sharing with them who Jesus is, that is the kerygma. And that story, I get goosebumps right now just saying the word, that story of who Jesus is in and of itself has tremendous power. It, the, the, the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend. At the story of Jesus itself is where the power of love and connection and, and this reality, this transformational reality comes from. It's not, it's not in the workbook. It's in, it's in the sharing of the proclamation of Jesus Christ. All right, so you can, you can look in that. Also, this is one of my favorite books. If you've never heard of Dr. Sherry Waddell, it's amazing. She was a convert to Catholicism in her adult life, so she brings a lot of really good understandings from her Protestant upbringing, very scripturally based. She's fascinated with the saints. She writes about the saints, but also talks about she has a really good understanding of the process of accompanying someone to have an encounter with Jesus which is something we're a little bit behind with as Catholics. But she's a Catholic now. She's on our team. So her stuff. And then Joe Paprocki, this is his latest book. And if you don't know Joe Paprocki, he's wonderful. He's actually from the south side of Chicago, grew up in a big Catholic family. Uh, he has a brother who's a bishop. And he's actually going to be doing week six of our talks together on his book. But it's Nine Simple Ways for Catechists to Cultivate a Living Faith. And that's what he's, he talks about. He talks about the catechist as a mystagogue. Not someone who's actually answering questions and sharing known facts and information, but someone who is introducing another person to the mystery of what it means to walk in this world in a relationship with Jesus. So, all on the same page. All with the same kind of an understanding of the direction that we need to go to. So that kind of synchronicity carries a lot of weight in this is really what the Lord is calling us to right now. I, I mean, if we are concerned about young people and the state of this world and the stress that they're under, how much more is Jesus heartbreaking for people? And how much harder is he trying to get us, those who serve him, to be those bridges that build those encounters that bring more people to him? All right, so this is from the new directory for catechesis, which is only a couple of years old. Charismatic catechesis, there's that K word. Charismatic catechesis is that Jesus Christ loves you, he gave his life to save you, and now he is living at your side every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. So do you tell those words to somebody? You can, but better, you share how those words are true within you. The, Jesus loves me and he loves you too. Jesus gave his life to save me, and he gave it to save you too. Jesus lives at my side every day and helps me, and he does the same for you. I'm the catechist now. 
sharing the story of Jesus through the lens of my own experience with that person. I actually asked a group of catechists once, like, what do you do in your class? What is catechesis? And this is not a judgment. It's just an observation. And they pretty much talked to, you know, we, we memorize these prayers. We do these lessons. We take the little test to make sure that they learned it again. And I said, have you ever shared with the kids some of your own experiences of your relationship with Jesus? And they looked at me like I had three heads. Like, why would you do that? Why would you do that? What does my own personal experience with Jesus have to do with being a catechist? And so if you're, if you're having that resistance, like, wait, wait, that's my personal story. What does, how is that going to help? I, I beg you to take that to prayer and let the Lord show you how that is the most important thing that you will ever do. Because those kids, here's, I used to say those kids could memorize all of that and it, and, and it doesn't matter, that's not going to change them. Now what I say is those kids could look up that information that you're teaching them in about a second and a half in a Google search because all information is at their fingertips 24-7. They do not need us to teach them information. They need us to show them what information is important and they should absorb and what information should be let go. Because they're in a stream of information that is flowing over them constantly and they can't discern between something as important as Jesus who saves them and a commercial for acne medicine. Because it all comes at them at the same rate in the same way. And actually for us as Catholics, we're behind the eight ball. We don't have fancy, I'm not dancing. There's not a fancy background behind me. I'm not doing TikTok in order to get it. There are other things that are capturing their attention that are of very little value to them in the long run, but they're in a fancier package. So the information itself is not what will reach them. But oh my gosh, if you introduce them to the mystery, they, my, I was just talking to my granddaughter, her favorite show, I've never watched it, Stranger Things. It's some, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it sounds, she said, Grandma, you won't like it. And she's probably right. But she's fascinated by this like alternative reality, things that happen in the invisible, what we might call mystical kind of things that are happening. She's fascinated by that. Well, that is Jesus. There is nothing more mystical than the Eucharist. Can I get an amen? There is nothing more mystical than that. But this is what I'm talking about. We're missing the boat. We're not. We're, we have this incredible mystery of this relationship with God who became human and then left us these things as these actual encounters of his grace and the Holy Spirit that's flowing all the time. We have this incredible stuff, but they don't know the stories. Because if we read it out of a book, and then the Holy Spirit came. So we're going to learn the Holy Spirit. That, that doesn't sound mystical to me. But if I say to you, you know, I, I had this experience, which is true. I was trying to decide if I should go to school and study, get a master's to be able to do this. I didn't know what God wanted me to do with my life. And I know you're not supposed to put God to the test or ask him for signs, but I'm, I'm a weak heart. And so I do sometimes have to ask him for help. And luckily, like with Thomas, he's always right there. Okay, you need this. You need a sign. Finally, give us a I'm at a gas station on Route 83. And I'm pumping my gas, and I've got my eyes closed, and I'm praying. And I'm saying, Lord, if what you want for me is to, is to go to, to study and to give my life fully to ministry in the church, I need some kind of a sign. I'm sitting there with my eyes closed. I open my eyes, and I kid you not, right in front of me is a, a picture of an angel. Because while my eyes were closed in the gas station, a truck pulled straight in front of my car, and the door, the painting on the outside of his door, I don't even remember what the name of the trucking company was. It wasn't Angel Trucking. I don't know what it was. But the image that was, was painted on the outside of the door was an angel. So literally when I open my eyes, what is in my windshield? What is in my view? An angel. Now, you could say, well, that was just an odd coincidence. Yeah, right. To me, that is the mystery of God. And I want to live my life in that mystery. I want to live my life in that sense that, that God is with me, loving me, caring for me, listening to me, that I matter to him. And he matters to me. And we have this deep intimacy in which he even understands how weak I am. 
and responds to me. And the moral of the story, yes, I did go to, how could I refuse? I mean, the angel was right there, of course, I went, and that's how I'm here. So that, the story of my life, and that my relationship with God of my life carries a truth and an authenticity and a witness that no book is ever going to give them. Now, once they begin to have that fledgling relationship, they're going to need information. That's true. But the life of the witness who has experienced salvation becomes that which touches and moves the hearer. See, I told you, I did not make this up. This is, this is from the bishops. The life of the witness who has experienced that relationship with Jesus, that is what touches and moves the hearer. Not the words, the life. But we have held ourselves back from sharing our lives. And we're going to talk about that. Why are Catholics so reluctant to tell our stories when there's power in the story? At the center of every process of catechesis is an encounter with Christ, a living encounter with Christ. That is the heart of it. And so I say that when you look at your lesson, the first question you should say about whatever it is, is the lesson in the book or what your, your catechetical leader has told you to talk about, the question you need to ask yourself is why? Why does this matter to the kids that are in, in my care, in my spiritual care? Why? Not what or how am I going to teach the facts. Why does it matter? And if there's a story from your life that relates to that, oh, you're gold. You are gold because that is the Holy Spirit prompting you, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about how that is real in my life. So that gives a living encounter. The aim of catechesis is to put people not only in touch but in intimacy with Jesus Christ. Only he can lead us to the love of the Father. So I'm going to ask you a question now, and I want you to think about that. You've been listening to me drone on and on for about an hour now. What do you remember from what I've shared with you? Do you remember any facts? Do you remember the name of the author of that other book? Do you remember, do you remember statistics? Do you remember, or do you remember the stories of what my life has been like since this living encounter with Jesus? That's the difference between catechesis and evangelizing catechesis. It's a dance between the facts and the lived experience of somebody who has this relationship with Jesus, who can speak with truth about what that looks like. All right, so do we have time to do this? Okay, so here, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I like old movies. So I'm going to apologize in advance for the quality of this movie. But if you are familiar with the, the movie the Teacher, I think it's called, it was a story of Helen Keller who was born uh, blind and deaf. And so she had no awareness of the world around her, and she was in a very dark place. And so the family is pretty desperate for how to reach her. And they bring in this woman, Ann Sullivan, who was is uh, practically blind herself, and she knows sign language. And she comes to be the catechist, the teacher for Helen. And what she's trying to explain to Helen is the truth of what this world is. But Helen, because she can't hear and she can't see, is in a world of darkness. She has no language for what she experiences. And it's made her pretty frantic and pretty... Um, She's in, a bad, she's in a bad place. She runs around like a, a, like a terror all the time because she has no frame of reference for anything that's happening. Like I'm having this conversation with you right now because we have language and I can express things and when that comes into you, you can understand it. She couldn't understand the world that she was living in. She had no language for it. So Anne's, uh, the teacher, what she does is she starts to teach her sign language. She teaches her the alphabet, she teaches her the, but, but Helen has no idea what this is. She'll do it because the, the teacher gives her candy, which isn't candy the best for to get kids to memorize things. You get your kids in the class and they all learn the Ten Commandments and you give them a candy. So you're giving them a language and there's nothing wrong with that. You need it, you need a structure. That's what I'm saying, it's, I'm, we're not throwing out catechesis. You need the structure. But in her mind, Helen has no idea what this means. She's just doing it for the sake of doing it. And how many of the kids in your class 
are just spitting back to you what you're asking them. This is this, answer it this way. Okay, this is this, I'm gonna answer it this way. You get a treat, you get an A, you get moved on to the next thing. What eventually happens, and this is the scene I'm gonna show you, and I just want you to notice the dynamic of what happens here. At one moment, in this, they have this shared experience, and Helen awakens to the fact that this is actually a language for a reality that she's experiencing. And I want you to think of this as the difference, another example of the difference between catechesis and evangelization. Because catechesis is the language. But if the child or the soul in front of you never connects that this language that you're giving them is a way to describe and capture what is the, the heart of the reality of living in a relationship with Jesus, then this just becomes nothing more than a language and eventually when they walk away, they can forget the language, they could look it up online, it doesn't matter. But once Helen realizes that this is actually a way to form an understanding of what life is about, this is a, this is a, a way to understand why we're here and what we're doing, then she wants to understand more, and then more catechesis needs to come. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom over here real fast and start this video. Just stay, keep your eyes focused and say a prayer. Oh, I just realized something, we probably don't have sound, or do we? If not, the good thing is that there is, um, there is a, uh, it's, closed captioned, so you'll be able to see it. Got it. Okay. Why is there... All right, there's not a sound right here, so just I want you to just watch what happens. The language that she has given her is for the word water. And suddenly, Helen realizes that water is actually the stuff that's coming out of the pump. What she feels, what she touches, what she experiences has a name. And she asks the teacher then, is that what you've been trying to tell me? That this language that you've been trying to give me is actually a representation for an actual lived experience. This is a language for what I know. And once she makes that connection, she wants to know everything. She wants to know more. She needs more catechesis. What is this? That's the ground. What I smell, what I feel, what I touch, all of it, it has a name. And that's what you've been trying to teach me, is the name for God. So the experience I'm having of God has a name. The experience I feel in my heart of love has a name. The name is Jesus. The, the conscience, the voice that speaks to my head and tells me what to do has a name. Yes, the Holy Spirit. She knows. Now she knows. In catechesis and in evangelization, there is a relationship that takes place between the language of faith the language of religion, and the experience.
And in that scene, what we see is the role of the catechist. The role of the catechist is to both teach the language, the catechesis, we have names for things, and also to connect the names for things with the lived reality of what they represent. And that's the part that we need to focus more attention on. We do a phenomenal job most of the time with providing the language. But without that connection to the fact that the language we are speaking about is, is a way to articulate and to share an actual lived experience of God, it just stays a language. It's not something that the kids will actually take into themselves. It doesn't serve them then. But if you can figure out ways, and again, don't, don't feel challenged by this. The Holy Spirit will guide you in how this will happen, and we're going we're gonna to talk about specific ways to make this, encourage this, to build on this. And one of them, if you haven't gotten that yet, is your own story. It's going to be the most important one. But there are other things that we can do as well. God has given us many tools and resources to invite others to understand that. When, when, she, when the teacher pumps the water, and spells water, and, she, and Helen makes that connection for the first time. Now she knows everything shifts. That is a charismatic moment right there that happens. And it's what we're going to be, we're, we're called to do. We've got to connect the language of our faith with the lived experience of Jesus. This is a great little chart. It's very complicated, and if you want to zoom in and screenshot and look at it, you can. Um, and it talks about different stages between catechesis and evangelization. So it talks about the differences between before someone has had an, a, a relationship with Jesus and doesn't know Jesus versus somebody want now who kind of knows Jesus. Then we jump in with a certain amount of catechesis and then there's a deepening relationship with Jesus and then we add more catechesis. So it's complex, but it also gives you the sense of that dance of the relationship between catechesis and evangelization. So are you sharing faith with your disciples in your class? Or are you sharing information? Hmm. It's something to think about. It's a question to consider because spiritual growth is not in tandem with physical and academic growth. So there's going to be a greater responsibility to accompany, to walk with the children in the class or the adults that you walk with because you need to know them in relationship and you need to be able to understand and listen for what the Holy Spirit is already doing in their lives or where they are on the journey. It's not one size fits all. You can't do one size fits all because you could have a, and I've had this happen before. I had a mom who came once and she had a, a little boy who was just going into second grade and she said, oh, I can't believe it. I didn't realize that it's, to, it's in the Archdiocese of Chicago, it's a two-year program to make a sacrament. So you have to be there in first grade in order to make first communion in second grade. He didn't go to religious ed for first grade. She didn't know the rule. And so she brought this little boy in and she said, I don't know what to do because he really wants to make his communion and he, he has this very strong desire to, to, be, to receive first holy communion, but I didn't sign him up last year. So is he going to have to wait two years? Okay, so am I... What am I listening for? Do you know the number one requirement to have a valid set to receive a valid sacrament in the church? Sincere desire on the part of the recipient. All those hoops we make people jump to are ways to look for sincere desire. But sincere desire doesn't always look like a specific template. So in the case of this little boy who has what the church says, a sincere desire to receive Holy Communion, Am I going to say no, that that doesn't matter because you didn't follow the policy of two years of catechesis? Where's the evangelization in that? So what I said to the mom is, you know what, let's see how it goes. Let's, let, let him sign up for second grade and let me get to know him. I'm going to have to walk with him a little bit. I'm going to walk with you. Let me accompany him. A lot of this is going to depend on what he already knows, where his relationship with the Lord is at. What have you done with him you know, at home? And does he, you know, how much does he understand about Jesus or the mystery of Holy Communion? Well, it turns out the kid knew a lot about it. The mom took him to Mass every week. So 
did, would it make sense then for him to wait? No, he didn't wait. He made, and he was probably the most excited seven-year-old, eight-year-old that day because he came from a genuine place of wanting to receive Holy Communion. Whereas other kids were, you know, not that they were against it, but they hadn't really maybe thought about it that much. He had thought about it a lot. And the mom was very grateful, and I think the Lord was grateful. Why would I keep him from Jesus? Because of a rule about catechesis. So that readiness based is going to actually free us up. If you were somebody who was like, you know, I have kids in the class that are ready and I have kids that are, yeah, you're right, you do. You have kids that are ready and kids that are not. So let's, let's work this in a different way. Let's not work this based on everybody who reaches this point and has taken X number of classes and been here. They all get communion and these kids don't. It, it calls us to a greater respect of the soul and the spirit in deciding readiness to receive a sacrament. It's not an academic event. It's an event of the soul. All right. So then in our next session, we're going to talk about this. There's a more enhanced way of looking at what it means to be Catholic. It's not strictly about, remember I told you when people would come in, the first thing I would do, what sacraments did you make? Because that was the box that we checked off. If you're a Catholic, you've made your sacraments. That is a piece of it, but it's much more, it's much more than that. It has much more to do with the relationship. Um, the Holy Spirit will set the timing, so we're going to have to put a lot more faith and trust in this relationship we have with the Holy Spirit on who's ready and who's not ready and what attention does a soul need, not based on strictly sacraments. We listen for the voice of God. We continue to catechize, but at the same time, we walk with people. This is an example that I use kind of as we're coming to an end here. This is an example that I use in parent meetings, usually First Communion or First Reconciliation parent meetings, to try to help to people to understand where we're going to go next, which is this enhanced awareness of what it means to be Catholic. So I talk about the fact that when you take your kid to swimming lessons, they, they and this is non-threatening, depending on the skill of the child, they end up at different levels. I think you could be like a tadpole or a minnow or a shark or whatever it might be. And as you look at the picture, you know, in the beginning, you need a lot of assistance. And then you get to a point where you can actually hold on to the paddleboard, but you still need some help. And then you can swim, but you can see she's a little bit struggling, not particularly comfortable. And then eventually you become a swimmer. Someone when you don't even think about it anymore, you just jump in the water and you're just, you're just swimming. You're just doing what you're doing. And that is not that dissimilar from what it means to be on a Catholic journey, especially in a family. So there's a level at which you receive your sacraments, and that's wonderful. I mean, that's great. And then you get to a point, well, you know what, we go to Mass maybe occasionally, maybe a couple times a year. You know, it's, it's a part of what we do. Um, and it's an important connection to certain holidays or things that we do or weddings and funerals. We're in church sometimes. Then you, it, there's, okay, well, it's not just about going to church. It's not just about what's out there. There's also a component of being a Catholic family that is actually internal. So we pray at home. We say grace before meals. We pray at bedtime. We, you know, I remember driving in the car and you'd see an ambulance and my mom would say, everybody pray for whoever's in that ambulance. You know, there's a, it starts to trickle into your life. It's, it's still, you go to church, but you're now, some of it's happening at home until the point where you are Catholic. You're actually living the life. And I don't know if you can see in this picture, but this, that's Jesus right there. So the family is all together, and Jesus is a part of everything that they do. And now they actually live, they do service, they go out in the world. They're, it's integrated into it. It's integrated into who you are. Being Catholic is more than what we generally limit it to. It's, it's a lot richer. It's a lot fuller than that. Jesus offers us so much more. So to get started, what's the key question to ask? And this is the question to ask yourself. What is my relationship with God? It's, it's part of Sherry Waddell's accompaniment training that they do. They, I, it's a, 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 her Siena Institute in Colorado Springs. It's a wonderful place if you ever have a chance to go and study there. It's a great place to study. But in her Forming Intentional Disciples, they talk about, she talks about when you meet someone, how to start to unwrap where they are on their Catholic spiritual journey. And since the, the 
foundation of it is this relationship with Jesus, the first thing you should ask somebody is, tell me about your relationship with God to this point in your life. Now, the interesting thing is if you ask most Catholics that, and, if, and you're watching at home, if I asked you that, we tend to answer with, well, I was baptized at this age, then I made my first communion, I was an altar server, I went to a Catholic school, I was confirmed or not confirmed, I got married in the church. And if you listen, that answer is actually about a relationship with the church. It's not about a relationship with God. So usually what I'll say, that, and if you ask people who are not Catholic, they don't answer like that. Like I work with people who are adults who are coming into the church. A lot of them are not baptized or they were baptized in another denomination. They may have no experience of church, formal church whatsoever. And I'll ask them, what is your relationship with God? And they'll say, well, I always knew God was with me from the time I was a kid, but I never really wanted to be close to God. Very different response. So if I ask a Catholic and they give me their, their relationship with the church, generally what I'll say then is, but what about your own personal relationship with God? And some people will look at me like, I don't know what that means. How do you have a personal relationship with God outside of the church? The church is my relationship with God, um, which is an interesting thing to pray about. But some of them will then say, you know, I was really close to God when I was little. I remember when, when my grandma would pray with me at night and I always felt like God was with me. And there is a relationship there with God that takes place. So that's another aspect of one of the ways that we can start to break into this new reality, this is actually a form that we have our year one confirmation kids do before they choose a sponsor. They actually have to interview three disciples, three Catholic disciples, and the questions they ask is, how does your relationship with Jesus impact your life? Why is your Catholic faith important to you, and what do you enjoy about the Mass? So if trying to hit that sense of what is, if someone's going to be your sponsor on this journey of faith, do they have a relationship with Jesus? Have they thought about that before? Because if they don't or if they haven't thought about it, you might want to consider somebody who can accompany you a little bit better who might have a different answer than this. So we're going to start asking different questions. We're going to trust in the Holy Spirit in the process. We're going to let go of the outcome that's in God's hands. We're going to focus on the process on how we hand on the faith. We're going to adjust our style to accompaniment. We're going to start to look for signs of readiness in children that maybe we didn't pay attention to before. And we're going to talk about readiness signs at all different ages. Readiness in their relationship with God and their desire to be closer to God becomes more of a priority in accompaniment of someone on the spiritual path than what they know. What prayers can they memorize? What do they understand? How many times have they attended a, a class session? So what would be helpful between now and the next time we're together? Start thinking about your own journey. Where you are now in your relationship with Jesus. How did that relationship begin? How has it changed over time? Where is it now? How has Jesus saved you? How do you encounter Jesus in a real and living way? And how do you live with Jesus every day? How is he a part of your life? Because the answer to those questions is going to move us forward to the next step in this process of moving from catechesis to evangelizing catechesis. Thank you for listening.